Our next segment, uh, we are going to hear from Tara Jones, who is a genetic counselor in adult neurology at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. She also acts as program coordinator for their MDA multidisciplinary clinic and clinical research coordinator for patients with hereditary nerve disorders. Tara currently serves as co-chair for a work group that advocates and supports genetic counselors newly entering the neurology specialty. Her research interests include data-driven service delivery models to improve patient and provider outcomes regarding predictive genetic testing. So Tara, thanks for being here. I just wanted to let you know real quick before you present, um, I did, um, or I am currently sharing those poll results. So 51% of those who polled have mitochondrial DNA. And um, so there's quite a few of, uh, of them on the line that are unsure. So. I hope that that was uh, informative and helpful for you. Yes, definitely gives me an idea of the landscape. So I guess to get started, um, I, I picked a clever title for today's talk to try and uh, bring a little bit of humor to uh, this chronic condition that a lot of the audience is experiencing. People when they face a hereditary condition, um, a lot of questions go through someone's mind and uh, feelings of doubt, feelings of guilt. Um, we know, of course, that it's not actually possible to, um, in, in many cases, a lot of people don't know that uh, what they had um, was passed down to their children and it wasn't knowingly done, it wasn't purposely done. Um, and so, uh, Though we know that our mitochondria comes from our mother, uh, there are plenty of other cases of mitochondrial disease where that wouldn't exactly happen. So I hope to kind of convey some of that to you guys today. Uh, disclosures, I am a shareholder of a couple of uh, genetic testing companies and I did receive an honorarium from MDA for today's talk. So uh, some of my objectives for today's talk, um, hopefully by the end of this, you will be able to teach your neighbor about the difference between nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. Understand why each person with mitochondrial disease has a different experience. Realize that you might still have mitochondrial disease with negative genetic testing. Familiarize yourself with the different inheritance patterns of mitochondrial disease and recognize that there is no way to predict the exact disease course of an at-risk family member. All right, so to give a layout of what we are talking about, uh, here we have a, a purple nucleus within the cell and these small pink bean-shaped organelles are called mitochondria. Um, so when we are talking nuclear DNA, we're talking about what is inside the nucleus. And when we're talking mitochondrial DNA, we are talking about these circular structures within the mitochondria themselves. What are the functions of these two organelles? Uh, you can think of the nucleus as the command center of the cell. It kind of controls the processes um, and protects the DNA. Um, whereas mitochondria, you might have heard in grade school as the powerhouse of the cell. We know that they play a, a major role in energy production um, and essentially also maintain a, a balance of oxygen and other metabolites and in turn can determine when cells live or die, replicate or migrate to different areas of the body. And so in most cells we have a single nucleus and many mitochondria which can divide and join together. Uh, so you tell me which is more important and that's kind of a trick question because both of them are. All right, uh, so I'm sure many of those in the audience can uh, relate to not being able to fit into their genes anymore because of COVID especially. Um, but those aren't the genes I'm talking about. Uh, on the right side here, we have another picture of a cell and this is a depiction of the central dogma of the, um, the uh, transformation of DNA into protein. 
So I like to think of this, uh, I feel like most people are familiar with cooking, whether they do it or not. Um, imagine that your DNA is your grandmother's cookbook and it is an heirloom and you don't want to mess up a recipe in the kitchen and get something spilled on it. Uh, so you create a copy of one of those recipes and that uh, copy uh, is what we call a gene um, on the RNA. And then um, you can see that these green pieces are actually removed and the red parts are pushed together. Um, the, the green parts are the introns and the red part is the exon. If we bring that back to the cooking analogy, that could be your modern touch to the recipe. So let's say you're out of eggs um, and you use applesauce instead. Um, you can still use that to create the final cake or protein. Whereas if you, let's say, needed baking soda in the recipe, but you were completely out and you couldn't get some from any of your neighbors, uh, you might end up making a cake that's completely flat and uh, perhaps no one would want to eat it. And so um, that kind of is a way to explain that we have some variations in our DNA that can be good for us and kind of uh, uh, move evolution forward and make us all unique. Um, but there are some variations that end up creating a, a cake that no one would want to eat. And that's uh, what we call a pathogenic change or a mutation. And this is how uh, mutations work. So um, I know that Dr. Kara actually went over this in some detail. Um, if we had a sentence saying the car was red, we know exactly what we're talking about. But if there's any change in that sentence, uh, the sentence gets scrambled up. And to kind of back up, I should mention that our genetic code is red in letters of three. So um, that's why when you do insert a B in front of the C, the whole sequence kind of gets pushed over. All right, and now we'll talk about the difference between the DNA within the nucleus and that within the mitochondria. So our uh, DNA uh, is typically referring to nuclear DNA. Um, so whenever, whenever you hear the word DNA and there's no N or MT in front of it, uh, people are likely referring to the DNA within the nucleus. And this DNA is made up of 23 pairs of chromosomes. And we get one copy of each chromosome from our mother and one copy from our father. The letters that make up the sentence are these four nucleotides right here, um, which are often abbreviated as A, T, C, and G. And the nuclear DNA contains over 20,000 genes. Whereas with the mitochondria, it is in a single stranded loop and each mitochondrial DNA loop has 37 genes. Um, but you can see that there are several different um, loops within the mitochondria itself. And then in addition, because there are multiple mitochondria within a cell, um, we have a lot of different varieties of mitochondrial DNA within a single cell. Okay. And so <clears throat> why exactly do we only inherit our mitochondria from mom, but our DNA from the nucleus comes from both mom and dad? Uh, the truth is that we don't really know. There are a lot of different theories as to why this happens, um, but you can see in this picture, the, uh, the egg cell, has uh, mitochondria within its cytoplasm. And in the sperm cell, the mitochondria are also within the cytoplasm, but 
along the tail of the sperm. And we know that the mitochondria within the sperm are important for giving the sperm energy to swim and reach the egg cell. And at the point of fertilization, uh, the head of the sperm um, does enter the egg cell and it appears that the, um, the, egg mem the egg cell membrane basically cuts off the sperm before the mitochondria can enter. Um, but there are people who suggest that uh, perhaps some paternal, uh, paternal mitochondria from dad, from the sperm, actually do uh, reach the fertilized egg. And there was actually a paper that came out in 2018 from CHOP um, that basically found a set of uh, three different families that were unrelated to each other. And it appeared that these family members had mitochondria that was inherited from their father. And this obviously uh, caused a lot of controversy. Um, then later in 2020, uh, Dr. Chinnery and colleagues uh, kind of proposed that there's another reason why it looked like these patients had paternally inherited mitochondria. Um, and so essentially, though it could be possible that some paternal mitochondria could end up in um, someone's genetic makeup. Uh, the general rule is that it is the mitochondrial DNA itself within the mitochondria only come from mom. Right. And so to make things even more complicated, uh, these are genes that are encoded within the nuclear DNA that make essential proteins for the mitochondria. So as many of you in the audience are aware, you can have mitochondrial disease with a mutation in either your nuclear DNA or your mitochondrial DNA. So how can you tell if your particular mutation came from the nucleus or the mitochondria? Um, all genetic test reports will look slightly different depending on uh, which test was ordered, which lab uh, did the testing, what year you had your testing done. Um, but in general, there will be a comment on the report of uh, the source of the DNA and what was exactly tested for. There will be uh, the name of the gene, the location of the specific genetic change, and the protein change that results out of that. So with mitochondrial DNA, your gene that is listed on the copy of the report will always have an MT in front of it. And likewise, the specific, um, oh, sorry. Uh, and then in nuclear DNA, on the other hand, you will see a italicized abbreviation of the name of the gene. When we go to the location of the variant, we'll have an M in front if we're talking mitochondrial DNA, and a C in front if we're talking nuclear DNA. Um, and you can see that the protein changes actually look somewhat similar, and so you have to bring that into context with uh, the um, M dot or C dot location and the name of the gene itself. So to recap, uh, the mitochondria and nucleus are essential parts of the cell, and each of them contain distinct DNA instructions. And these instructions are like cookbooks that tell us how to make a cake or protein. An error in a recipe or gene can bake a cake that no one would want to eat. Uh, the nuclear DNA includes pairs of 23 chromosomes with roughly half of its instruction coming from mom and half from dad, whereas the mitochondrial DNA includes a set of 37 genes that we inherit solely from our mother. 
Mitochondrial disease can be caused by pathogenic variants or mutations in either nuclear or mitochondrial DNA. And the specific nomenclature of your genetic variant, uh, the M dot versus C dot and the name of the gene can tell you if you have a pathogenic variant in nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA. Now, uh, Backing up really quick, I do want to mention that test reports will uh, report out a pathogenic variant where they know that this specific change in the gene is causing it to not work properly. But sometimes you will have some uh, genetic changes identified that are classified as variants of uncertain significance. And that is a gray area where the lab hasn't seen the change often enough to know if it's truly causing the gene to not work right or if it's just a unique difference. And so um, just because you have these genetic changes pointed out on your report, you'll also want to look at the classification, whether it's pathogenic or uncertain. All right, so now we are moving on to the complexities of the mitochondrial DNA itself. Um, so here uh, we have a concept of my mutational threshold. So these red rings are considered to be the mutant mitochondrial DNA. The wild type, or uh, I guess we'll call these black rings, are the normal DNA. And so you can see that these pink mitochondria are still fully functional and they happen to have more of the wild type DNA compared to the mutant DNA. But when they pass that threshold and enough mutant DNA enters the mitochondria, that uh, mitochondria itself does not work properly. And that's um, what you might see on a mtDNA report is uh, the, the mutational threshold for the specific condition that it's associated with. Another feature of mitochondria is that they can fuse together and create a single larger mitochondria. And this happens during times of stress and high energy demand. Or likewise, it can uh, divide by process of fission and turn into two separate mitochondria that are smaller. And that creates uh, essentially more mitochondria within the cell and can help with quality control so um, you can kind of imagine if they were able to kind of uh, pinch off the mitochondria and have, for example, up here, a functioning mitochondria and a non-functioning mitochondria, perhaps the cell could get rid of this non-functional mitochondria and um, therefore increase the number of working mitochondria in the cell. So you can imagine that there's a lot of pieces working to this puzzle that's constantly changing. Um, so there, there is a lot of complexity in mitochondrial DNA. Another feature of mitochondria, this is considered, uh, this is called the bottleneck effect. Um, and if let's say these yellow balls are mutant mitochondria, but the blue balls are wild type or normal mitochondria. If you kind of pour it out through a bottleneck, uh, you're not going to have the same proportion of either wild type or mutant in each uh, container. And this, uh, this phenomenon is, is thought to happen in women um, during development. So, uh, women are born with the number of eggs that they will have throughout their life. And so this is something that happens even before uh, women are born. Um, and having a mixture of wild type to mutant DNA uh, is what we call heteroplasmy. 
So on a test report, you might see that uh, someone was 28% heteroplasmic for uh, said mtDNA mutation. And that basically means that out of all of the cells that were looked at, 28% of the mitochondria had that mutation. Um, whereas this particular egg cell has all uh, wild type DNA and therefore is homoplasmic and has no difference within it, um, but homoplasmic wild type, so not at risk of any mitochondrial disease. And to add an, another layer of complexity, uh, we might not have mutant mitochondria within the egg itself, and at conception, there might be no mutations, but as the fertilized egg or zygote uh, multiplies and divides, uh, a, a mutation within the mitochondrial DNA can pop up sporadically. And because of this, it creates a set of cells that have some mutant mitochondria and some uh, wild type mitochondria. And the effect of this means that when someone's born, they're going to have, uh, will be quote unquote mosaic, uh, just like the tile uh, artwork form, um, where some of their tissue will have the mitochondrial mutation and others will not. And Beyond that, as we age, our mitochondria is under stress um, and our mitochondria develop uh, acquired mutations throughout life. And this happens to occur at a higher amount in the cells that, are, um, that have a high energy demand. So this would be areas such as the skeletal muscle or the brain. And so when we're talking a sporadic mutation, it's not something that was inherited from, from mom or dad in that case, um, but it happened after conception. And then acquired is something that happens throughout one's lifetime. So with all of this complexity, um, a, one person with mitochondrial disease is one person with mitochondrial disease. Uh, you can see the, uh, the differences of uh, neurologic symptoms and non-neurologic symptoms. And um, if we're talking especially about a mitochondrial DNA mutation, because the mutations will differ in um, each cell and within each tissue. It really does depend on uh, which tissues have the most mutational load to tell us how symptoms might um, manifest. And finally, reaching a genetic diagnosis can be difficult. Um, in general, mitochondrial disease has about a 25 to 50% detection rate. Um, that is likely to be a lot higher um, depending on how many um, diagnostics were done before we reach the genetic testing point. Um, so as Dr. Kara kind of mentioned, not everyone with this constellation of symptoms will have mitochondrial disease. And so additional diagnostics can be done to kind of increase the likelihood that someone truly has this clinical diagnosis of mitochondrial disease. But to reach a genetic diagnosis, um, if we're talking about nuclear DNA, the process is pretty straightforward. We can collect DNA from saliva, cheek cells, or blood. Um, but if we're talking mtDNA or mitochondrial DNA, the process could be invasive. So uh, we can collect it from blood, sometimes even urine. Um, but 
if if uh, this uh, primary initial testing is negative, uh, it might get to a point where we would need to do uh, muscle biopsy, for example, to actually uh, test the cells within the tissue parts that are affected. And so that process can be very invasive and uh, you undergo surgery for that. Um, whether insurance will cover either the procedure or the genetic testing becomes very um, difficult to determine. And I guess not likely. Okay, so if your uh, mutation is on nuclear DNA and um, you have children, the possible inheritance will matter uh, based off of the inheritance pattern. So here in dominant inheritance, you only need one copy of the gene to be mutated. And here, uh, Mom has an uh, mom is affected and has a mutated copy shown here in blue. And with each pregnancy, there's an equal chance for her to either pass down the working copy and have an unaffected child or the broken copy and have an affected child. And so basically with each conception, there's a one in two chance that the child will uh, inherit the mutation and likewise will not. And this is the same for both males and females. If we're talking recessive, let's say that uh, we didn't have any family history of mitochondrial disease and um, a child is born with mitochondrial disease caused by a, a mutation within the nuclear DNA. That basically means that both copies of the gene have to be mutated in order to cause disease. And if either parent um, is a carrier and they have one working copy of the gene, then they uh, would not be affected with symptoms. And so because of this, we have this uh, possibility of having both of the broken copies passed down to a child, or we can have a mixture, or um, both parents can pass down the working copy. That leaves us with 25% chance, or one in four, to have an affected child, 25% chance to have an unaffected child, and 50% uh, chance to have a child who is a carrier, but not at risk for the disease itself. But if we're talking recessive inheritance and the father, for example, is affected, then we know that um, there's only the option of passing down the broken copy of the gene. And therefore, each child will be a carrier, but not necessarily at risk for the recessive disease. If we're talking X-linked, um, so, our, of our 23 pairs of chromosomes, uh, one, one pair is the sex chromosomes that determine whether we are male or female. Women have two X's, men have an X and a Y. So X-linked uh, disease refers to a mutation on the X chromosome itself. Uh, in that case, women, because they have a working copy of the gene on their opposite chromosome, they might have less severe symptoms than males. If we have a, a woman who is um, affected with a X-linked disorder, there is a 50% chance. It works similar to dominant autosomal dawn inheritance where uh, it's equally likely for her to pass down the broken copy as well as the working copy. But if we have an affected father, we know that his X chromosome is only going to go to his daughters, but the Y chromosome is going to go to the son. So every daughter, um, no matter how many conceptions they have, will essentially have a mutated copy. 
but every sun will be in the clear and be unaffected. And then if we're talking about mtDNA, um, the risk to children varies depending on which parent is affected, if mom is homoplasmic or heteroplasmic, and if the mitochondrial disease is inherited or acquired. So for example, uh, because dad is affected here, um, and we know that children are only going to get their mitochondria from mom, none of the children will have risk for the disease. If mom is affected, and in this case she is homoplasmic and all of her mitochondria have the mutation, then all of her children are likely to inherit at least the majority of the mutant mitochondrial DNA and therefore be at risk of disease. Whereas if mom is heteroplasmic, um, there's a chance with the bottleneck effect that she um, has children that are completely unaffected, ones that are more severely affected, and ones that are on the more mild end of the spectrum. However, if any parent in this case had an acquired disease and they were not born with any mitochondrial mutations, then uh, we might assume that their egg cells or sperm cells are actually unaffected. Um, so uh, there wouldn't necessarily be a risk for them to pass the disease down. And finally, uh, because of all of this complexity, uh, even if we're talking about nuclear DNA, we can't predict the exact disease course of an at-risk family member. There will be differences in age of onset, symptoms that appear, the severity of symptoms, and if symptoms will ever occur. And I tend to say in a lot of discussions on uh, results disclosure, that there, is, there are exceptions to every rule in genetics, and we are constantly learning more about different genetic modifiers that aren't even on the gene of interest that could be affecting someone's level of severity and how the disease presents. And to recap uh, that very lengthy second half, uh, the mitochondrial DNA has many possible variations. A mother's level of heteroplasmy varies in each egg cell, and this process happens before mom is born. The mitochondrial instructions can further be edited spontaneously after conception. And as you get older, mitochondrial instructions can edit even further, causing acquired variations that vary by tissue type you can still have mitochondrial disease with negative genetic testing. The chance to pass down a nuclear or mitochondrial pathogenic variant varies on the specific genetic cause, the sex of the parent, and whether the parent was born with the pathogenic variant. And finally, if a pathogenic variant is passed down to a child, we cannot accurately predict what their disease will look like. And here I have my references, and you can refer to those uh, after MDA posts this webinar. And with that, I give you my contact information, and if you're not in the Los Angeles area, you can always find a genetic counselor on this website here, findageneticcounselor.com. That's awesome, thank you for that. Of course, that question gets asked often. All right, we do have some questions for you. Okay. How often do you recommend having your genetic testing redone? That's a good question. So uh, if we're talking about autosomal um, or, sorry, nuclear DNA, we are born with that mutation. So it's not likely to change throughout one's lifetime. Okay. Uh, if someone has a mutation in their mitochondrial DNA and it's been identified earlier in life, there's not really a reason to retest later in life. 
uh, though the amount of uh, mutant mitochondria might change by tissue type as they get older. Um, but we can still say that person has mitochondrial disease because of this mutation and the levels of heteroplasmy might vary as they get older, but they still have the disease. And in order for a person to understand what disorder they actually have for mitochondrial, is that something that they would ask their physician or would they need a genetic test for that? Uh, so some people they, can, go ahead. They, they know they have mitochondrial disorder, but not sure which one. Yeah, so uh, some people have a very defined disorder, um, but other people have a disorder that can overlap with other mitochondrial diseases. Okay. And, and so um, I always kind of recommend if you're going to be seen in like a neuromuscular clinic, make sure that they have a genetic counselor on staff that can help determine which testing is appropriate and which sample type would be needed to send off. Um, but if you go to a place that specializes in mitochondrial disease, chances are any of the physicians are going to be well aware of those intricacies. Okay. This person would love to know if you have had any patients that have a rare genetic defect, GUK1. Both mother and father have this um, genetic defect, but on different parts of the gene. So um, I personally have not had any patients with that. Um, okay. We've got a couple of patients that come to our MDA clinic with mitochondrial myopathies and PEO for the most part. Uh, what is considered a large or small deletion size? That's a good question. Um, you'll want to pay careful attention to the limitations of the genetic report. Um, some can detect up to 15 base pairs in length, and then after that, exonic level deletions that are much larger, but they can't detect the in-between. Okay. And so, um, generally speaking, a small deletion is less than 15 base pairs in length and would be detected with a typical testing methodology. Okay. Okay. Will therapies that are targeted to treat disease, which are due to mitochondrial mutations, be effective for diseases of caused by mitochondrial deletions, such as Kern-Serre syndrome, or do mitochondrial deletions need their own therapeutic treatments? That is a good question. I'm not sure if I have the answer to that. Um, I'm not aware of any gene therapies out there right now for mitochondrial disease. Okay. Um, so it, I think deletions will probably be harder to modify compared to like the point mutations where they can just replace that particular change or the duplications where they can kind of uh, lower the effects of the mutation. But when we're talking loss of function, it tends to be trickier. Okay. Um, I just I want to ask this question out loud just to make sure she said that she joined late so she apologizes if you said this in your presentation but I just want to make sure her question gets answered. Uh, my four-year-old has an MTCYB gene affected understanding that this is maternal should all my kids be tested. I have five and they are all very different and I know you mentioned that in your slide earlier so. Right so um, I would I would bring up the question to their pediatrician, um, possibly to a pediatric neurologist or mitochondrial specialist. Um, it's not necessary to have children tested unless they're showing symptoms. Okay. Um, and typically, if uh, there's a chance that children could be affected later in life, we like to uh, allow them to make that decision themselves after they turn 18. Okay. We yeah, have quite a few questions here. Um, okay, this person. 
I was diagnosed 14 years ago with an MT DNA mutation that only me, my child, and one other person had. There are now 17 of us. With that muscle biopsy and the family history, it was considered the cause mutation, uh, it was considered the causative mutation, mutation at the time, I apologize. We have not had a, um, exome sequencing. Does our diagnosis still stand or do we need to get retested? Um, so if, if a mutation has been identified, I think it's safe to say that that's what's going on in the family. Okay. There, there can be uh, changes throughout one's life, and so that will kind of change things a lot. But generally speaking, the younger you are when you get a diagnosis, that is essentially what you were born with. Um, and so if that changes throughout one's life, um, that would be considered to be more of an acquired cause rather than hereditary. Okay. My husband had a muscle biopsy and, is, and still hasn't been genetically tested. It has been five years. We are in Minnesota. Something apparently happened with having staff specialized in the lab prep. I'm not sure what happened. How should they follow up? We have not talked to a genetic counselor. That's tough. So a lot of people will undergo diagnostic muscle biopsy for determining if someone has a myopathy or what type of muscular dystrophy they might have. And so when they're doing it for those types of diagnostics, they typically embed the tissue in paraffin. Uh, but for genetic testing, it is uh, preferred and sometimes required by genetic labs to have fresh frozen tissue. So it really does matter how they prepare the tissue and if there's any fresh frozen tissue that was set aside. Um, but it might be worthwhile to talk to a genetic counselor about um, if their blood can be tested to see uh, if there's a mutation there. Okay. Is deletion size correlated with disease expression and or progression? Um, I don't know the specific answer to that. I think it would matter pretty much on the level of heteroplasty. So okay. if you have a large deletion, but you're 10% heteroplasmic, uh, that would be completely different compared to a smaller deletion that's 50% heteroplasmic. Okay. Um, if 44% of M3460 gene pathogenic for, L, for LHON, L-H-O-N, is that high enough for diagnosis of mitochondrial disease? That is a good question. I don't know the specific uh, genetic threshold for LHON, but I can definitely look that up and share that with you, Nicole. Okay. Um, we have a couple more. Does it matter that the point mutation has an N of 17, so it hasn't been really studied? Um, they put it's a 12123C T point mutation. Um, so if the test report says pathogenic, uh, chances are you can. You can trust that it's truly a mutation and um, even if there aren't that many patients with that specific point change mm -hmm. uh, they can still um, very much uh, with with certainty say that this is a true mutation um, i think the hard part comes where you make general generalizations off of 17 patients with this point mutation you really can't say if 80% of people experience this, that you're going to experience it. Okay. So we tend to need to look at hundreds of patients to really have an idea of the possible natural history. Okay. Could a patient um, diagnosed with mitochondrial disease with a muscle biopsy actually have chronic fatigue syndrome? So if it was truly diagnosed as a mitochondrial mutation within the muscle itself, 
I would say that the chronic fatigue is more likely to be a symptom of mitochondrial disease rather than a completely separate entity. And unfortunately with chronic fatigue syndrome, I don't think they've really found an actual cause for that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, perhaps a lot of people with chronic fatigue might have an underlying uh, mitochondrial myopathy and just be unaware of it. Okay. Um, okay, this is this person. Um, this I think this is our last one, uh, but they wrote I would die. I was diagnosed with mitochondrial DNA deletion and CPEO. It was termed not genetic. However, in retrospect, my mother, who has since passed away, was told she had eye movement issues from many strokes, which a CT scan did not confirm. I was also suspected of a stroke before a CT scan cleared that, and I was diagnosed by muscle biopsy, et cetera, as CPEO. My mother and I both had exercise intolerance, fatigue, weakness, digestive issues, and surprisingly low sodium. Is it possible that there is a disorder that I inherited from my mother, but there isn't a current test for at this time? That's tricky. So, so CPEO, or, or chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, is often due to acquired deletions within the eye muscles themselves. Okay. And so uh, it's quite possible that your mother truly did have issues with eye movement because of a stroke. Um, I think it is interesting that there are other features that uh, are similar between the two of you, but. Um, I wouldn't necessarily think that's due to the mitochondrial deletions in your eye muscle. Okay. All right. Okay, I think that's it. We had quite a few questions to get through. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara, for being here. Have a great rest of your day. Of course. Take care, everyone.